So the topic of this video is muscles, specifically skeletal muscles. Now you see three types of muscle represented here, and I, I know we covered this when we talked about tissues, but I just wanted to give a quick reminder um, that there are the three types, and just as a review, let's just talk about smooth muscle. So it's involuntary, meaning you don't have to think about it. Specifically, we find it in organs like our digestive system, and it together this smooth muscle, these smooth muscle tissues work in something called peristalsis, right, to move our food through stalls, oops, excuse me, our digestive system. Now cardiac muscle is also involuntary, and when I say involuntary, you don't have to think about it, right? You don't have to say, okay, beat, beat, beat to your heart, okay, which tells me, okay, we need to say here, this is where we find cardiac muscle in the heart, okay? And it is, it is different from smooth muscle, first of all, where it's located, but also it has what we call striations. It looks like striping under the microscope, and it has to do with the types of fibers or filaments that are in the muscle tissue. But our focus today is on skeletal muscle and first of all, this is voluntary, right? We decide to move our arm or our leg or we hold our posture. So we're thinking about the movement of these muscles. Now, we find these muscles attached to and around skeletal bones. Okay, so the, the point of these muscles is to move our bones, right? And I want you to see, even in this image, hopefully on your end of the video, you can see this striping pattern all along the fibers of this muscle tissue. So I'm going to put it striated, and we'll talk a little bit about why and what causes that striping or striation pattern. So what we see here is a muscle fiber, okay? And... Um, this essentially is a single muscle cell. They can be very long. In other words, you, we talked about the longest bone in your body is the femur, right? Your upper leg bone. So you can have a muscle cell that stretches the length of that femur bone, okay? They can be up to 30 centimeters in length, obviously, depending on the length of your femur bone. Now, what I want you to see within this muscle fiber, we have um, units or bundles of things called myofibrils that are repeating over and over. And as you notice, you can see the striation pattern, right, that's shown on the outside of this muscle fiber. And what we can see is we see these red and blue markings. And the reason that those are listed there or written, drawn that way is because there are two types of fibers or filaments that you find. Okay, there's actin. filaments, and we have myosin filaments, and those are represented by the red and blue repeating patterns there within that the myofibril. Now one other thing I want to point out to you is notice that we have this repeating pattern all along the length of this myofibril called a sarcomere. So we have one here, right, then we would have another one here. Okay, all the way down the muscle fiber or the muscle cell, we would have these repeating sarcomeres. Well, we're going to learn why that's important and what that has to do with muscle contraction as we walk through this video. Okay, remember I mentioned to you the red and blue represented fibers. So we're sort of taking a close-up look at those red and blue markings that were on the eat along the myofibril, right, that made up the sarcomere. So the first thing that I want you to see, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna follow this as we go through the video, is the thin filament, the actin filament is actually the blue filament, and the thick filament, or what we, the myosin filament, is shown in red. Now the way muscle contraction works is that these myosin, so the red filament, the myosin filament, notice that it, it looks like it has these tiny little projections that are coming out of the myosin filament. They are actually going to grab on and attach 
to the actin filament and shift and move those more toward the middle or toward, you know, the interior. That is what we call a contraction. And if you imagine that that's happening for every single um, sarcomere, then wow, uh, that's going to be a huge change, right, in that muscle. So uh, let's look. So up here, right, would be at when the muscle is relaxed and not contracted. Down here would represent when the muscle is contracted. And notice the difference, okay, if we look right here at something we call the Z line, I'm going to change colors right here. If we look at this Z line, okay, so in other words, that's one sarcomere, right? Look how much the Z line has shifted, okay? And what has happened is, notice these smaller, thin actin filaments have slid toward the middle, right? These have moved this direction, and these have moved this direction. And they were shifted by the larger myosin filaments. So if you imagine every single one of these sarcomeres along the, the muscle cell or along the myofibrils, if they're all contracting in that way, you can see a very large movement in the muscle contraction. So I want to look at a, even a, a more close-up view of what in the world is going on. How is that working where the myosin filament is shifting or moving those actin filaments toward the midline? Now, there are some details in this image that you don't need to worry about. There's two things listed, something called troponin and tropomyosin. These, you can just know that these are regulatory proteins. In other words, when they're in the way, the muscle contraction is not going to happen. So what we see is as long as we have calcium ions present, that's going to remove these regulatory proteins so that muscle contraction can happen. Now, as you probably know, muscle contraction takes energy, right? Why do we work out? Well, we work out maybe because we want to be healthy, but sometimes it's because we want to burn calories, right? Well, burning calories means you're using energy. So in the cell, if you'll remember, ATP is the typical energy source for the cell. So muscle contraction takes ATP. It takes energy in order to do that. And what you see is right here, these little red projections, those are those myosin heads that are going to attach and shift the actin filament. So you see it's attaching here to the actin, and then it's sort of going to shift. So you see, oop, it just shifted to right here. And with it, it carried this actin filament. It shifted it in that direction. So what was here is now here. Okay, then it can go back to its normal position, attach, and shift again. Okay, so that can happen depending on how much contraction, right, is occurring and for how long. So that's sort of at, you know, if you could look at it in detail up close, what's happening between the two filaments. Now let's zoom back out and kind of look at this picture again. So again, what we were looking at is literally what's going on, right, between the myosin and the actin. And big picture, what you really need to understand is it's called the sliding filament model. Remember, the actin and myosin are filaments. And all this means is exactly what's happening. The actin filaments right, are sliding toward the center so that they're more compact. right? They have contracted, and that shortens that sarcomere. And if all of them are shortening, then we have a much shorter muscle. Now this is, we're zooming out again and we're looking at this whole muscle fiber. So I, what I want you to imagine now is if each sarcomere that we, you see pictured here between these lines, if each one of these shortened all along the muscle fiber, that's going to make a significant difference, right? Now, I want you to, just for a second, think about your bicep muscle, okay? So extend your arm, put your hand on your bicep while it's relaxed. And then I want you to bring your lower arm up, right? And when you do that, you can feel that muscle contracting in your upper arm. Now, the way that works is the muscle has an attachment. So at the end of the muscle, 
There is a tendon that's attached to the lower arm bones. And then there is also a tendon attached up, um, well, it's, it's, there's multiple tendons, multiple muscles, but they're attached right above the humerus, up around the scapula. So when it's attached up around the scapula and it's attached to the lower arm bone, when that contraction happens and that muscle shortens, right, what's it going to do? It's drawing up the lower arm, okay, because it has to, right? Now, the tendons can't be stretchy. If the tendons were stretchy, then you wouldn't get movement, right, from the arm because the tendon would just stretch like a rubber band. So the tendons have to be not elastic or inelastic in order to get the movement of bones when these muscles contract. Now, we're, we're going to talk about the nervous system um, in another upcoming lesson, but I did want to tie this together for you before we stop the video today. And that is, we, we mentioned that skeletal muscles are um, voluntary, right? Which means that our nervous system, is, our central nervous system, is telling the muscle when to contract. So what you see here is a signal that's coming from the spinal cord. And it's being sent through a neuron, which is part of the nervous system. And the signal then is received by the muscle fiber, right? The muscle cells. And what happens is this neuron, this nervous system cell, isn't actually attached to the muscle. There's actually a space there. So when the signal reaches the end of the neuron, which the, the part of the neuron is called the axon, we'll talk about that in the nervous cell, in the nervous system uh, uh, unit, but when it reaches the end, it doesn't actually make contact with the muscle cell. Instead, there's a little space there. And so you may have heard of the term neurotransmitter before. And so what happens is in that space, the nervous cell or the neuron will release a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And for muscle contraction, this is a very specific neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And that acetylcholine is released into the space between the neuron and the muscle cell. And the muscle cell happens to have receptors that will bind to that acetylcholine that was released. And what does this do? Well, it causes calcium ions to be released inside the muscle cell out of something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, we said that there are regulatory proteins that are preventing a muscle cell from contracting unless calcium is present. So releasing calcium in this way gets rid of these regulatory proteins, and then we can have that sliding filament model where the myosin head is going to bind to the actin and shift right toward the midline and cause the contraction to happen. So that's an overview, and I just wanted to make sure I pointed out that the contraction of muscles is occurring because signals are being sent from the nervous system to tell those muscles to contract. So I hope that's helpful.